This is a feast of unleavened bread. It's, uh, it's one of those things that you just can't quite put a, a handle on. I, I love the days of unleavened bread, not just because it's a whole week really of, of kind of trying to consider the work of God in our own lives and what's happened with us and what we expect to happen in the future. Kind of like fasting in a sense, we eat unleavened bread and every time we eat that unleavened bread, hopefully we're thinking about the meaning of it and the purpose of it. And so it's kind of a cleansing and encouraging kind of uh, a feast. I, I consider it second only in that sense to the Feast of Tabernacles in, in terms of a, a, a full week of focused and concentrated service to God. So it's really exciting. <clears throat> I also like the food. Uh, I, I agree with Mr. Servidio. It's not too difficult probably to gain some weight during the, uh, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread because we, we tend to like that unleavened bread and eat quite a bit of it. Uh, and because you're not getting the bulk you get probably from whatever other bread you normally eat, you probably eat more of it. I don't know. At least I seem to. I, I enjoy it a great deal. And the things that go with it. Of course, Mr. Servidio evidently has not yet discovered Nutella. <laughs> he mentioned uh, butter and jelly and various things. Uh, I think maybe the two most fattening parts of it are peanut butter and, and uh, Nutella for me. <clears throat> but everybody to his own. You enjoy whatever it is you enjoy. <clears throat> I hope that you do. Anyway, it's a great time of the year and looking forward, of course, to the end of the journey at the Feast of Tabernacles and the last great day, which comes soon enough. I should mention before I start today that I, I hope that you will take the sermons and sermonettes today, not as individual messages, but uh, as a whole because I sat there and listened from Royden's comments in the offertory message this morning to uh, Mr. Servidio's sermon and then uh, 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 Kevin's, I'm trying to call it Kevin Burke, Kirk Bevins or something, you know, mine won't work sometimes. Anyway, we put it all together, there's a, there's a thread and there's a message and I, I know that Royden and I at least did not talk at all about our topics and yet his topic uh, very much led into mine and then I saw that uh, the practical side of what Mr. Servidio gave this morning and the, uh, the instruction we re just received from Kevin are all, uh, all fit together as, as one message in a sense, one story, one reality that we live in that I hope that we appreciate and enjoy and even rejoice in. I'm going to tell you a story this afternoon, but it's a very big story. And it begins long ago. Yes, if I were telling it to a child, I would say once upon a time, long, long ago, in this galaxy, and on this very planet, there was a garden, the very first garden man ever had. It was probably filled with tall trees, fruit trees, leafy shrubs of every description, amazing variety of shapes and sizes a profusion of colorful flowers probably created a dazzling view in any direction you wanted to look. Here lived butterflies, hummingbirds, honeybees, probably an endless menagerie of strikingly beautiful creatures that God had created and placed in this garden for the enjoyment of mankind. Here also lived two beautiful people. A man and a woman, perfectly formed and in vigorous health, who had it all. Well, all that is except the lovely, mysterious tree near the middle of the garden. To the couple in the garden, there was something special about this tree. It was forbidden. God said, don't eat the fruit of it. Perhaps they could have resisted that tree and its fruit, as their creator had told them to do, except that along came another life form and persuaded the woman that this tree was of great value to them and should not be ignored or overlooked. It was, in fact, a tree to make them wise, whatever that meant. <clears throat> 
You read these scriptures sometimes and doesn't your mind kind of wander around and say, how, yeah, how does all this fit together? What did the woman know about needing to be wise? What had God given them in terms of total understanding or mental capacity? What, what had God created in them that made her think that being wise would be a good thing? Maybe it all comes from the actual uh, subtle deceptions of Satan the devil as the serpent presenting the story to her. It would make them wise, but it would also make them, and I think this is probably the bottom line, it would make them equal to their creator, no longer subject to his authority. And besides that, the serpent said they wouldn't have to die after all. Probably the beginning of the immortal soul lie. They didn't have to obey God. There was no risk in doing whatever they chose to do. Do we know, especially those of us under about 40 years of age, who didn't sit for hours and hours listening to this story in the 1970s and 80s, do we know what happened in the Garden of Eden during the first days of mankind's time on the earth? Let's look into the book of Genesis for a little bit and pick up some details of this story. We find them, if I want to start here in, in Genesis chapter 2, most of us know Genesis 1 reasonably well and perhaps Genesis 2 fairly well. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. I'm only going to read brief excerpts here to uh, keep us on track time-wise. Uh, chapter 2, verse 7. And the eternal God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Thankfully, the New King James actually translates it, not a soul, but a living being, which is what it really means. He became a living being. We go on. The eternal God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. You find later when God kicks him out, that he says, go back to the land from which you were taken. So this is outside the garden at this time. He plants a garden, and he puts the man in it. And out of the ground, the eternal God made every tree to grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So amidst all this beauty and this lush vegetation that we described earlier, which I think we can conclude from the overall perspective of God's creation, two trees are singled out, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's go down to verse 16. Skip down to verse 16, if you will. We'll skim through the story for a moment. And the eternal God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now this ultimately, we come to understand, was eternal death. It was the ultimate penalty for sin, which is the penalty Christ later paid. It is not human death, which is to all men, because we're made of the dust of the ground and given a limited temporal life on this earth. But God said, you may not eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 21, and the eternal God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the eternal God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. So God creates a mate for Adam and they become our progenitors, so that we are all descended ultimately from Adam and Eve. Again, do we know what happened in the Garden of Eden at this time? Notice this brief excerpt. Uh, well, wait, let's go, one, let's go one step further before we go there. <clears throat> in chapter 3, verse 1, we know this story, but I want to review it quickly. Chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. Again, a good word, cunning, compared to the old S-U-B-T-I-L-E, subtile or subtle in the uh, King James, which doesn't mean subtle per se, but something a little different. Cunning is the proper word. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the eternal God had made. 
And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So she was fairly clear on the words. She was fairly clear on the instruction. She was fairly clear on what God actually said. And God had probably made it quite clear, but she was a physical, flesh and blood human being without the Spirit of God. So in verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Uh, there's the world's first lie, as you find Christ referring to later. You shall not surely die, for God knows. Now he sets up the problem. God knows. This creator of yours, who claims to be your creator, knows. And remember, Eve wouldn't necessarily have known in one sense that God was her creator, but Adam certainly would have known that God was her creator. And Satan the devil tried to convince her or deceive her by saying, God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's an important phrase we'll come back to in a moment. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. It says her husband with her. We're not sure where he was when he came on the scene, how much he was involved in the, in, in the hearing of uh, Satan's deception. We're told later in the New Testament that Eve was deceived and Adam was in the transgression. Adam, of course, was responsible. And we're not trying to put the burden on the woman here. She was part of the human race. She was our human mother. But she was deceived by Satan the devil and went ahead and did what he told her to do. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the eternal God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the eternal God among the trees of the garden. Now here they've gone from just being created. We don't know how much time passed here. We assume, frankly, it's not very much because we're not given anything of what Adam and Eve did to serve God or to uh, be taught by God except what brief statements we have from uh, the narrative here that says God told them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So obviously he told them other things. But we're not given exactly how this all came about. We have to piece things together again from some of the New Testament comments. But they hid themselves from God, from their creator. There's a lesson from the day for the days of unleavened bread. We come to the Passover, we've examined ourselves, we lay ourselves open to God and to ourselves, and we say we are sinners. And during the days of unleavened bread, when we're coming out of sin, does Satan deceive us into thinking the way to come out of sin is to hide from it? The way to come out of sin is to hide it from God. The way to come out of sin is to declare that we don't have any. That we're all together clean. Verse 9, then the eternal God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So now even the creator is not allowed to see them because they have a conscience that didn't exist before. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? God saw that the mind had already been corrupted. That what God had created and said it is very good is now suspect and this human mind has already been corrupted by the influence of the power of the spirit of the power of the air the prince of the power of the air has already corrupted the minds of both the man and woman to believe something god created is actually not good god said it was very good satan said no it's not you need to hide The man said, the woman whom you gave to me be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Now, where does that accusation come from? Point the finger at somebody else. Who's the accuser of the brethren? Satan, the devil. So we find here in this very early history of man that God gave them instruction in the right way, 
they rejected that way and followed the influence of Satan the devil, who is later described, of course, as the God of this world. Let's look at Paul's analysis of this in one brief verse in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We've been pretty much in and out of Romans and Corinthians and other of Paul's writings today. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. This is a long context and it's very instructive. If you haven't read it lately, you should. But I want to read only this verse for the moment. Verse 12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men, notice, because all sinned. Sin entered the world, he says, through one man. He goes on later to show that sin was overcome in the world by one man, that is Jesus Christ. But we're not going to go there at the moment. Notice he says, sin entered the world, death through sin, because the wages of sin is death, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So we're not, as some churches teach, paying the penalty for Adam's sin. We're, in this, we're paying the penalty for our own sins, but sin was allowed into the world by Adam, and in that sense, uh, he's responsible to a degree for our condition in this life. We are part of his family. Sin entered the world and then all sin. Why did all sin? Because Adam, as the father of the human family, had rejected the authority of the eternal God. Rejected the authority of the eternal creator who put him here. And had thus cut himself off from the presence of God and from the power of God by sin. Adam had access to the power of God. He cut himself off from that power and from any resistance to sin, and he sinned. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was another mysterious tree in this garden. We just read about it. Did you catch it back in Genesis 2 verse 9? It says the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So in addition to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there is a tree of life. We're not told much about it, except that it was there. We're given hints later on, and again, all the way back to the book of Revelation, there are discussions of the tree of life being made available in the future. But we're not told too much about the tree of life in the context here in Genesis. It was just there, along with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But, of course, later there is more, and really it's much, much more. Let's go back to Genesis 3 again, please. Genesis 3, <clears throat> I should have told you to keep your finger or your book or your candy bar or whatever you have in that spot, but I didn't. Genesis chapter 3. I want to pick up this statement, which we're aware of, but I, and I hope we understand. Genesis 3, verse 22 now, as we come to the end of this chapter, and the end of this scenario and this incident. Genesis 3, 22. Then the eternal God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. What did Satan say? He said, You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now it says he's become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Oh, now we get a whole lot of information. He could take of the tree of life and live forever. So this tree of life represents a spiritual opportunity that becomes spirit life that is eternal. So the two trees are pretty diametrically opposite, aren't they? We have a tree of the knowledge of good and evil that is really the tree of death. Alongside the tree of life, which is not only a tree to provide physical life and health and strength and abundance and joy, but eternal life. 
So there was something about this tree of life that would give eternal life. And now Adam couldn't have it, nor could any of his descendants, because the wages of sin is death, and cut off from God, man under Satan's influences was doomed to sin. Now, lest you get confused about this little verses 22 through 24, understand that it's a rhetorical statement that is already a fact because God had already said, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. So it isn't a statement that says Adam had the chance to do both. It's a statement that says because he took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he cannot have of the tree of life. It isn't really an option for Adam. It's a rhetorical instruction for us that the tree of life cannot be taken if you are eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So Adam and Eve had taken of the tree of death. Why? Why'd they do that? Well, of course, as I said, Eve was deceived and Adam was in the transgression. But when we read the phrase, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we tend to separate the words and maybe read it, the tree of the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil. It needs to be taken as a whole. It is a phrase that says, quote, the knowledge, I'm sorry, the, <laughs> the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil is a, fra is a phrase that means they had the power to decide what is good and what is evil. That wasn't their power to take. It wasn't Satan's power to assume. He had done it, but it wasn't his. And it wasn't theirs. They cannot just presume to make judgments about what's good and what's bad. Only God can make that judgment. So we should read it as it is the tree of, quote, the knowledge of good and evil. That is our ability to decide and define what's right and what's wrong. All the problems in the world today can be traced to this one occasion. That's why it's here. It's why it's important for us to understand. It's why it's important to know what we're dealing with in the world around us. It's why it helps to know who we are. Because the human race rejected. Understand that. Get that in your head. The human race rejected the authority of God to tell them what was right and wrong and chose to make their own rules about right and wrong including that they had to hide because they were naked. And again, all this was done, of course, under the influence of the power of Satan the devil. And mankind has been making his own rules ever since. We see it all around us today. It's in spades in our news daily and weekly, in our politics, in our economics, in all of the things that man does. We make rules and we say, these are, these are our rules and you should keep them except when you don't want to. Then you make new rules. One of the great rules we have, and I don't have time to go here, but one of the, one of the great rules we have in the world, in the American world today is tolerance. You gotta tolerate anything and everything. I'm okay, you're okay. Started clear back in 1974 or five. When the book, I think, came out, I'm okay, you're okay. I remember one of our early ministers, been long gone from the church, and as far as I know from the truth, but got up in the uh, feast in the East Coast in about 1975 or six, maybe seven, and he was wearing a big sign across his chest. Maybe you heard me tell this story because it made a big impression on me. It said, I-A-L-A-C, great big bold letters. And of course, he talked for a while before he explained the sign, and when he finally explained the sign. The sign meant, I am lovable and capable. So you need to te treat me as if I am lovable and capable because I am. No matter who I am, what I am, what I believe, what I stand for, how I live, 
I'm okay, you're okay. I am lovable and capable just like you are. Now that was probably one of the early beginnings of the modern approach to everybody is free to be who he is, who she is, do our own thing, and nobody should judge us one way or the other. Being judgmental in the sense of saying, I don't believe what you are doing is right, is considered a horrible evil in today's world. American world, again, I speak for our country. Tolerance is the God. You must be tolerant of anything and everything because you don't make the rules. Guess what? Neither does God. God's law is irrelevant. Man knows all the answers. Man can come up with conclusions that he wants to follow. And it's becoming more and more clear in our uh, political dialogue, for example. We make the rules as we go along. Man doesn't know how to do that. Let's go back to the book of James. We go to the New Testament here for a while. New Testament, James. James chapter 3 and verse 13. James chapter 3, verse 13. Here's how James put it almost 4,000 years later. Verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? He's chiding the church a little bit, but his point is pretty clear. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct. I'm reading from the New King James. Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. You are, you are boasting about something you don't even understand. This wisdom, that kind of worldly wisdom, does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. The New King James, I think, says, I mean, the King James says devilish. It is earthly, sensual, and demonic. And that's exactly right. It is Satan's wisdom, so-called, being passed on through human experience. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. And of course we find also from Paul's writings, God is not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14, God is not the author of confusion. So where there is envy and self-seeking, confusion and every evil thing are there. It's a way of life that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It's a way of life that the whole human race has experienced because they can't experience anything else. Humankind of and by himself does not have the capacity to know right from wrong of and by himself. He does not have the capacity to make right decisions or even stick with the decisions he makes. I remember sitting in the auditorium one time in the Bible study on a Friday evening and hearing Mr. Herbert Armstrong say, man is insane. And of course, everybody woke up, sat up. What do you mean insane? And Mr. Armstrong went on to explain scripturally that the human mind, without the spirit of God guiding it, is not only vulnerable to, but virtually always under the influence of Satan the devil, and therefore his judgments, his knowledge of right and wrong, his ability to function is corrupted by Satan's influence and in that sense he's not mentally whole. You know the scripture, what is it, 1 Timothy 1, 7, God has given us the spirit, not, not the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God gives us a sound mind. You and I sitting here today are supposed to have a sound mind, but mankind of and by himself can't have a sound mind. Now, Anybody who is unconverted would not appreciate that statement. But when you analyze it and look at it biblically, that's basically what God is saying. Mankind has been in that sense, if I can be bold, insane since the Garden of Eden. And only those who have come out of that system can really have any sanity. The world's wisdom is devilish. It is demonic. Demonic. 
contradictory. Verse 17, here's the contrast. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Wow. <laughs> Which would we like? Which would we like to be classed in? The group that has envy and self-seeking and boasting and bitter envy, all those things, or those who are pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits. How does God look at it? That's, that's, hardly, a, that's hardly even a comparison. That's not like going into the supermarket and picking up a couple of, uh, you know, what, avocados and saying, let's see which one of these might be the best for what we need right now, which one of these is ripe, which one of these is close to the time I want to use it, or uh, which one of these is blemished. You know, could be any, anything, peaches, there are all kinds of things you pick up and you try to judge. These two things aren't in that category. <laughs> These two things aren't in this category. This is, this is what Mr. Servidio mentioned this morning. You ask for bread and you give him a stone. No, these two are miles apart. They're di diametrically opposite. One is the wisdom of the world, which comes from the influence of Satan the devil from day one. Generically speaking, day one, the very early part of a human existence. And the other is God's wisdom which has been rare and very tightly, how shall I put it, regulated down through human history in terms of whom God has called and what he has done among those people. Who is wise among you is what James asked in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? How do you prove it? Show by a good conduct. Here we are keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread in which the whole issue is good conduct. But good conduct, not measured by man's standard. You can have lots of, quote, good conduct in the world. I could ask for a show of hands. How many of us got that award in school during our time? Lots of us. Good conduct. Good conduct on the job, maybe. Good conduct in your neighborhood. You can have all kinds of good conduct, which is acceptable within God's law, but which is limited to man's standard and does not include really the law of God. These two are an avocado and a potato when you're trying to make guacamole. You, you, you can only use one of them. You can't use both. They're, they're not interchangeable. But the world has been operating on that basis from the beginning. Romans chapter 1, again a classic scripture we know and understand but needs to be reviewed during this feast Romans chapter 1 the world hates us when we even read this if it understands what we're doing this is one of the reasons we will no doubt be persecuted and banned from the airwaves and things of that sort over time <clears throat> Romans chapter 1 because we teach this and we read this and we believe it Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Yes, Adam and Eve could see his attributes from what he made, the garden he planted, where he put them, and what he told them. So from the creation of the world, they're clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, that is the creation, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. That's not just limited to Adam and Eve. That's the leaders of humanity down through history. They glorified him not as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Darkened, corrupted, twisted, insane. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Doesn't get much more direct than that, does it? Professing to be wise, they became fools. Now, does a person who professes to be wise know that he's a fool and he just professes to be wise anyway? <laughs> No, he's professing to be wise on the basis of what his standard is and what his definition of wise and wisdom is. It's not, it's James's definition. 
of the world's wisdom. It's not God's definition or James's definition of God's wisdom. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. We could go on, but we won't. The rest of it talks about the consequences of that judgment and how they corrupted their lives because of their perspective. We'll drop down to verse 28 and pick up the summary. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. And again, it describes some of those fruits which are rampant in the world today and which we would be condemned for judging as sin. Because who are we to judge somebody else? Their lifestyle is their business. Leave them alone. We don't care what your God says. What's the bottom line? Psalm 14. Psalm 14, verse 1. Here's the crux of the problem. And it really, again, goes back to that incident in the Garden of Eden, which appears to be the first expression of this truth that's stated here in Psalm 14, verse 1. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Nobody has authority or power or control over me. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want, and there is nothing and nobody to tell me no. I am my own God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. And it goes on again to describe the environment on the earth as a result of man's ignorance of the way of God. This, by the way, is the human condition which confronted Jesus Christ when he came to the earth as a human being. He saw all of this in spades. This is where man was. When you see Christ talking to the religious leaders and giving them instruction and evaluations, if you will, hypocrites, you know, puffed up, vain, all kinds of cheating and sinning going on in the midst of those who claim to be wise and claim to be spiritual. It's what Christ was facing. He knew it. He knew it before he came. And he certainly endured it while he was here. John chapter 8, what did he say? How did Christ define or describe or analyze the state of mankind when he walked the earth? John chapter 8, verse 42 to start. John 8, verse 42. Nobody should have trouble keeping up with me and finding the scripture, huh? John 8, 42. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You're not hearing who and what I am and what I'm saying to you. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. That's pretty clear. That's pretty plain. He's talking to, yes, the religious leaders and the critics of the day, but he's really talking to all of mankind. This is God's perspective on the human race in the days Christ walked the earth. What Peter later called a, what, wicked and perverse generation. You're of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. The truth was never there from the time that he became the adversary and it certainly wasn't there when he deceived Eve and when he influenced Adam and Eve to turn their backs on God in the hope of destroying the entire human race which was made in the image of God as we've already heard today and intended to be born into the God family. So, there is no truth in him. 
When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's why I said it was the, probably the, the first lie, at least in the human realm, when Satan said, you shall not surely die. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. You see, mankind doesn't have it in him. He doesn't have what it takes. Lots of scriptures we could go to. Jeremiah 79, the heart is deceitfully above all things and desperately wicked. There are all kinds of perspectives in the Bible described to show what man is and what he has been. What does that have to do with you and me? What does it have to do with keeping the days of unleavened bread? Well, everything. It tells us what kind of world we live in. It tells us who we are. It tells us how we should live by contrast. And it helps us to understand that there is still a tree of life available. That most people can't come to it. And that there is a tree of death and people flock to it. We were reading in the book of John. Let's go to 1 John, written much later. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world. Now again, he's not talking about the trees. He's not talking about the flowers. He's not talking about the hummingbirds or the bees. He's not even talking about good music or exercise, or food. He's not talking about not loving the things that we take for granted as physical necessities or physical pleasures. Those are fine with him. He made them for our enjoyment. But that enjoyment and that consumption is defined by the rest of his law that tells us how to live and how to think. God doesn't want us to eat unleavened bread as a penance. God doesn't want us to eat unleavened bread so we can say, I hate this stuff. But I'm doing it anyway, and therefore I'm righteous. <laughs> That's exactly the opposite reaction. We should be thankful for the bread that we have. And we should, in a sense, learn to appreciate it as a spiritual symbol, whether we actually like the taste or the texture or not. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. He's talking about the world's way of life. He's talking about the spiritual standards of the world. He's talking about the ignorance of the world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now he goes on to describe what he means by the things in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. So he puts parameters on it. It's things that appeal to those things that are contrary to God's purpose and God's plan and God's law. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. The contrast, brethren, is remarkable. The contrast is overwhelming. The way of God and the way of man, or the way of God and the way of Satan, have no fellowship. And that's stated in other places as well, 2 Corinthians 6 and other places. No fellowship between the truth and the lie. Between the spiritual people of God who are in fact, spiritual Israel coming out of spiritual Egypt. I think we all understand that analogy enough. Not that we shouldn't repeat it. We do year in and year out. <clears throat> I'm not pausing for dramatic effect. I'm pausing to find a tissue. There's a big difference. I had to go to the car during lunch and dump the old ones and get new ones because this stuff that so many of us have kept me busy all during the morning service. 
And I was just about to sneeze right there, but managed to avoid it. Those are purely physical things, but they are very frustrating sometimes. The world passes away and the lust of it. All of this system is going to go. That's why we're here. That's what we hope for. That's what we live for. That's what we wait for. That's why we keep the holy days. It's why we keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It's why we pray thy kingdom come. It's all going to go. Now, whatever takes its place is going to be better. We've known people in the past, especially young people, who think, well, the world is going to, the world's going to come to an end and I'm not going to have time to enjoy life. Well, whatever comes next is a whole lot better. Some of it we know, some of it beyond that millennial rule of Christ and the white throne judgment, we don't necessarily know in terms of the details of existence in God's family. But it's going to be better. Better even than the Garden of Eden. Not just better than Houston. Sorry, Jim, Houston. Humble in Houston. We, we Yankees, like Jim and I, can't get, we can't get used to that. Can't quite bring ourselves to say it. I told the, my congregation in the South, I've, I've, tried to be, I've tried to develop this effective way of saying humble that is kind of a combination of humble and humble so that you can take it however you want and I get off the hook because I can't quite say humble without feeling like I'm offending those who live in Houston. But if I say humble, I sound really strange to me. It doesn't sound strange when you say it, if you're a native, but it sounds strange when I say it. It's all going to pass away. And God's way is going to replace it, and it's going to be fantastic. Let's notice here, though, in verse 16, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Does that ring a bell with you? That rings a bell with me. That reminds me of scripture back in Genesis 3, 6 that we read a little while ago. I'm not going to go there. Where Eve said, it says, when Eve saw that it was a tree that was good for food. Let's just loosely translate here. The lust of the flesh has to do with the taste of the food. Really want some of that. Pleasant to the eyes, very specifically says here, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. Eve saw that it was pleasant and beautiful to look at. And thirdly, it was desired to make one wise. I can easily translate that to the pride of life. So what is being described here as loving the world and the things in the world, the things in the world are the very same things, apparently, that Adam and Eve fell for. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And God says, don't do it. So loving God and living by his law is the exact opposite of man's way, which is, of course, the way of Satan the devil. One leads to life, and the other leads to death. It's that simple. We don't always see it that simply when we're kind of in the midst of arguing with a family member, a mate, a child, a parent. We don't always see it that way when somebody offers us some temporary pleasure of some sort. Drugs, alcohol, sex, money, whatever it might be that the human mind is attracted to, we don't always stop and say, whoa, wait a minute. Does that fall in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life? During the days of unleavened bread, that ought to cross our minds. So we've seen pretty quickly here and pretty clearly, I think, what happens or what happened from the beginning of man's time. But we know, do we know and understand what is happening in the end of man's time? In the end of this age, the time in which you and I live, when man's time on the earth is coming to a close. I noticed listening to, like as I said, from Royden to Jim to, to uh, Kevin, they were all sort of talking about the same subject in different ways today, and rightly so, because it is a feast day. 
and I hope we take them all together. John chapter 3, back to the Gospel of John. John chapter 3, and guess where we're going? You tell yourself in your mind where we're going, and I'll, you can see if you're right. I won't even ask you. John chapter 3, verse 16. One of the world's favorite scriptures of which they are completely ignorant. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world. Now, we just read he said, don't love the world. But what part of the world did he say not to, not to love? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, pride of life. The way of life that Satan has promulgated in the world. But God loves the world in the sense that he loves his creation. He loves his people who are created in his image, human beings. And this is talking about human beings in the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, really believes, and belief is described other places, should not perish, that is, die, the tree of death, but have everlasting life. God sent Jesus Christ so that the death that had passed upon all men could be relieved or reversed and everlasting life could be made available. That plan was in place from the beginning, which is why people like righteous Abel and Abraham and you know, back to Noah and forward to David or anybody else could be saved because God had already determined the fact that it was going to happen. And he was going to send Jesus Christ and he was going to save mankind from himself. So God sent Jesus Christ to save mankind from an eternal death and give him eternal life. I, for one, appreciated the fact that some of the, some of the other speakers covered some of the things I couldn't figure out how to work into the time frame. You're thinking I didn't figure out even how to work this into the time frame, but my time frame is always a little different than yours. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I just somehow turned away from John, and now I have to go back there. You should be three pages away unless you're like me. John chapter 6. Some of this we read during the Passover service. John chapter 6, verse 47. I realize that many of you old-timers, as somebody called them already today, have heard and understood and processed this story many times. I'm not sure that people under the age of about 35 or 40 have ever heard it that much. Some of us have preached it now and then, and I don't know how much you've heard it wherever you've been. But it's something we have to know and we have to keep in our minds. It was so important that God's servant, Mr. Armstrong, repeated it over and over until some people, unfortunately, got tired of hearing it. I hope we never get tired of hearing that specific truth that mankind has been cut off from God and on a wrong path for his entire existence and that only the coming of Jesus Christ made that point moot because now everlasting life has become available. And even then, it's only available to those whom God calls, which is a, a different subject. Verse 47, John 6, verse 47. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. There it is, connected directly with what we just read. He who believes in me has everlasting life. Why is that going on? I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Often when we eat that bread during the days of unleavened bread, we think about the fact that it isn't leavened, it's not puffed up, we're, we're coming out of sin. But as has already been mentioned by Mr. Servidio and others, when we take in that bread, that unleavened bread, we are symbolically consuming the life of Christ. I am that bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna. It was miraculous. They ate the manna in the wilderness. It wasn't spiritual. They are dead. This, meaning myself, this is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. 
If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Christ came to give himself to pay the penalty for sin, but also to bring a different way of life, a new way of life, a perfect way of life. And he lived it perfectly, and he's the only one who ever has. This should have a familiar ring in our story as well, shouldn't it? The bread of life provides everlasting life. The tree of life held everlasting life untapped by the human race. In a sense, we could simply say, when we eat of the bread of life, we are eating of the tree of life. Or had they eaten of the tree of life, they would have been eating of the bread of life. It all goes back to Jesus Christ as the perfect example and the perfect teacher and the power of the Holy Spirit flowing from him and the Father that give us the ability to live a righteous life. John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Christ in the beginning of his prayer to his Father on the night of his betrayal is described like this. Verse seven, chapter 17, verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh. Given him authority over all flesh of all time. We're told other places that there is only one judge and that's Jesus Christ. That he should give, notice this, this is his purpose, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Once God calls, then Christ will work with that person to bring him to eternal life. And you and I have that promise. Verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So Christ says, if they know me and they learn what I am teaching them about you, then they also know you. And they will, in fact, have the foundation of eternal life. You know, when we come to the Passover, we remind everybody that Paul said to the Corinthians, as often as you eat this bread, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. We ought to remember during these days of unleavened bread that as often as we eat this bread, and we won't maybe eat too much more of it, although we'll have it, some of us, at least one more time today, some of us will have it through tomorrow because we won't go out and we won't have groceries, and so we'll just have eight days of unleavened bread, and that won't bother my family at all. Every time we eat this bread, we eat, and we show the life. Not the death, but the life of Jesus Christ. The Passover bread and the unleavened bread of this feast are different. The Passover bread represents Christ's body being given for us. The unleavened bread we eat today shows Christ's life being given to us so that we might have life and have it eternally. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we've been here briefly today. I want to read a full segment of this before closing uh, with one more scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> Hopefully you have read recently or clearly remember the wanderings of Israel, which have been also partially recounted today in the messages we've heard thus far. Israel had lots of big problems coming out of Egypt to the point that the whole first generation had to die except for Joshua and Caleb. We come to 1 Corinthians 10, we, we find out some of the reasons that had to happen. Because they had been called out of Egypt was a type of sin and a type of the whole world and given a fresh start. And what they really wanted to do was go back and be like they had been before, which again is going back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of death. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. 
that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. That is the cloud that followed Israel and led Israel. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. He's painting a picture of the cloud being the water overhead and the Red Sea uh, divided on both sides being the water into which they were immersed. It was a type of baptism. They came out of sin and they came into the promised land through a process uh, through the wilderness that we've already been talked to, told about. <clears throat> all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. So Joshua and Caleb and Moses and Aaron and the rest of them all drank and ate the same things spiritually. What was that? They all drank the same spiritual drink for they drink, sorry, drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. That is, you can see by the results. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. So now we get some specific instruction about what is right and what is wrong, what's good and what's evil. From God's perspective, not from Adam and Eve's perspective. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, a, basically a sexual orgy. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, ignoring the leadership and the direction and the instruction of Christ. Nor complain as some of them also complained, a murmur is a better word probably in the King James, and were destroyed by the destroyer. See, Satan's always there, ready to pounce and see that we do the things that will bring the death penalty upon us. Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So there, all those stories about Israel are written for us. That's why we recount them and study them and read them a lot. Verse 12, I'll stop here. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. See, we can't think we stand because we judge ourselves by man's standard. If we judge ourselves by God's standard, we'll realize something still has to change. Let's go to verse chapter 1. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 1. I'll close with this scripture. Put... Uh, Paul on notice here, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It might take me about 30, 30 minutes, Paul, but I'll close with this scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I am kidding. Don't get worried too much. Let's pick this up in verse 30 because it's basically, again, a, a summary statement of truth that is bound up in our keeping of the Passover and the days of unleavened bread and all the holy days of God and all the commandments of God. But as we've heard already today, we cannot do that by ourselves at any time in any way, shape, or form. Verse 30, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God. Not worldly wisdom that's devilish and demonic, but wisdom from God and righteousness through the perfect keeping of the law, which he shares with us through the Spirit of God. And sanctification, being set aside to be his people and be born into his family. And redemption, he is going to bring us through whatever it is and see us to the end and save us from sin. Right, sorry, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That as it is written, he who glories let him glory in the Lord. If we've learned anything through these days of unleavened bread, I hope it is that one phrase. And anything through this sermon and all the others given today, all wrapped up into one package, come down to that phrase. He that glories, let him glory in the Lord. 